thoughts in a more generalized manner, and that is, I read your book, Atlas Shrugged, and I was wondering about the position that Eddie Willers was left in at the end, of, or near the end of the book. Oh. Uh, and I was wondering how this, how the Eddie Willers of the world, so to speak, would fit into the earth. Philosophy, rather than being left sitting on a railroad track in the desert. I don't quite. I missed part of your question. You you wonder what will happen to the Eddie Willers of the world? Yes, I I as I read the book, the this part was left somewhat amiss to me because I see that or I feel that there are probably more Eddie Willers in the world than there are Dagny Taggarts and John Galt, etc. Yeah, and that's a very good question. Well, Eddie Willers in Atlas Shrugged is the symbol, in effect, the representative of the best among rational, uh, average men. Yes, that sir. is, he is morally as good as the heroes, but he's not a genius. He's yes. a man of average intelligence and a very scrupulous and high moral character. Now, Eddie Willers is the first and the worst victim of any sort of dictatorship, statism, or collectivism. Uh, Eddie Willers can survive only in a free society, in a society where the Hank Reardons and the John Golds and the Dagny Taggarts are free to function. He is at his best, and he carries his own weight, and he works productively in their kind of society. Mm -hmm. But he is too good to be able to survive or compromise with a collectivist state. In a collectivist state, he necessarily has to perish. He doesn't have the intellectual or spiritual resources to be fully independent and to vanish or to escape. He cannot stand on his own, but he cannot compromise with the evil around him, and therefore he perishes. Uh, the reason why I left him in that position is precisely to around the question which you asked. In other words, I wanted to tell the reader, here is the position of the best among average men. Mm -hmm. If the Dagny Taggarts or the Golds happen to come along, they will save him. If not, he will perish, but he cannot survive in a collectivist state. So that he doesn't die necessarily, but his question, in a, his fate, in effect, is left to the reader. If you do not want him to perish, you better think over your ideas, check your premises, and advocate a free society. He needs it more than anyone else. As right. to the geniuses, they're self-sufficient. They'll escape anyway, but Eddie will perish. Thank you, sir, for your call. Thank you very much. Hollywood One, 9911. Our guest, Miss Ayn Rand. I'm Michael Jackson on KNX. Hello. Yes, please go ahead. Miss Rand? Yes? Uh, I introduced myself as Aldo Rose Manet, a writer and foreign correspondent. And I have a, a question to ask you. But first, I would like to say that without going into any of your books, that I feel that they make an enormous contribution to present uh, uh, thinking because actually they do present a very... Uh, a brave and uh, interesting point of view, and they make people think, and this is terribly necessary. Thank you. Uh, so now I wanted to ask you on, the, on what you said about these people who came back from a visit to Dr. Schweitzer and said he had these stock of American medicines which they thought he didn't even know the use of them. If you accepted their story as true or in any way um, questioned it, uh, I uh, accept it as very likely to be true by the nature of uh, everything that we know about Dr. Schweitzer. However, it's not first-hand knowledge. I would say according to his publicly announced philosophy of an altruist, that is, the story is very likely to be true. Hmm. And remember that the people who said so are uh, James Menon Williams and his wife who are liberals, or at least Mr. Williams is a very prominent liberal, and uh, would be inclined to be in sympathy with uh, Dr. Schweitzer. It isn't said by 
writer's enemies, but by men who ideologically are likely to be on his side. Miss Rand, I, I ask... That's why I believe that it is probably true, but... Uh, well, Miss Rand... One can only speculate about it. Would you be willing to allow me to explain those medicines? I will tell you that over many years, I have helped Dr. Schweitzer in many ways, little ways he wanted me to. For instance, I was instrumental in getting the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station to take uh, to a received soil from his place and experiment with vegetables and plants that would grow there. But which, look, I... Uh, well, I want to tell you about the medicine. Uh, we're not here to discuss... Dr. No, but Spicer. you see, a thing like that going over the air, uh, don't you feel that that should have another side because... No, I think you should write to the Detroit paper. I'm to going to do York that. Times and to Mr. But Wilson. I want to tell you well, that he didn't use them because he didn't believe in them. Well, that is possible. They're not because not he was issue. ignorant. But, uh, well, now, uh, Miss Rand... Uh, the issue is his philosophy. <laughs> a question, please, Miss Rand. Uh, when people have been critical of Miss Rand on the program, you have, uh, to put it mildly, bristled, ma'am. You haven't enjoyed it. And isn't it even less fair to criticize the second-hand information of G-Men and Williams, known as Soapy Williams, about the man who is now dead? No, may I point out the morality involved? Please. Uh, <clears throat> one should not criticize Dr. Schweitzer on a program to which people listen because they want to hear him. If you were interviewing him or his admirers, you may criticize me all you want in my absence, but not with my sanction and permission. But you passed the on the information. Dr. Schweitzer. You passed on the information. him with his sanction, but in his absence, that is when he is not helping us, when we're not using his prestige in order to be heard, we are free to criticize any public figure, and Ms. you're Rand? free to criticize me all you want to, Ms. Rand? without my sanction. You? No, I don't mind your saying this. No, but... Ma'am, please, Ms. Rand is giving an answer. Would you please hold? It's totally irrelevant to the subject, isn't it? Please, Ms. Rand, will you answer this? Uh, you, um, uh, being an important personage, and this is a station with literally thousands and thousands of listeners, and you uh, pass on this information from these people and also call Dr. Schweitzer a power-hungry autocrat. So I, knowing him so well over all these years, feel that if you are fair and you have this integrity you speak of, you would allow uh, somebody who knows him to say that this is actually not so. All right, let's Ma'am. assume it isn't true, but now if you know him, will you answer a question for me? Yes, I but will if I can. If I want to. It interests me very much. Why, if Dr. Schweitzer believed in the <coughs> value, the preciousness or the holiness of life, why didn't he fight the spread of dictatorship and mass slaughter in the world, first in Nazi Germany, then in Russia? For the simple reason, ma'am, that a pianist doesn't play the cello. Let me answer. Different to that let me answer this. Please. When, uh, let me answer this. You asked the question. All right, now get on with your answer, please. Uh, the Nazi Germany, when that was going on, uh, Dr. Schweitzer was absolutely isolated and also cut off from France. He couldn't even receive his medicines that he used to get from France. And this is where I came in and got things sent to him from America. Fine. Thing. So he was, why didn't you fight that battle? Oh, no. Because not one man can fight all battles, ma'am. Your John Galt didn't fight all battles. Tell me what he could do. Uh, the man who wants to fight for life should start at the most important level, instead of burying himself in Africa. Isn't it possible, ma'am, that disease and hunger are the most important immediate levels? He didn't bury himself. No, um, isn't it possible, ma'am, that many of us consider different levels to be important and that hunger and disease are perhaps the initial ones that have to be overcome? Well, then <coughs> one should explain how one reconciles that with one professed yes. reverence for life. Well, if, if I think one, that... one uh, believes in the value of life, then one should establish a hierarchy of values he and did not that. help one village 
We when did a that. whole continent is perishing in horror and where all civilized men should fight. Dr. Schweitzer has lit more lamps of uh, reverence for life all over the world, I believe, than any other living man. Well, ma'am, now let's please take it at, to that point and give someone else a chance to make yes, comments. indeed. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Good night. Hollywood 19911 is the number. Our guest, Miss Ayn Rand. I'm Michael Jackson. May I quote you again, ma'am? You say, one of the most eloquent symptoms of the moral bankruptcy of today's culture is a certain fashionable attitude toward moral issues, best summarized as, and I'm quoting, there are no blacks and whites, there are only greys. That's right. You say, this is asserted in regard to persons, actions, principles of conduct, and morality in general. Black and white, in this context, means good and evil. The reverse order used in that catchphrase is interesting psychologically. Why do you object to the greys? Why do I object to the grace? Yes. Well, now, let's define words carefully. What is meant by gray in this context? Well, first of all, you have to know what is black and what is white. Uh, right. Black and white in this context means evil and good. Right. And a gray is a mixture of the two. Now, uh, why would I or anyone object to the gray? Your question is self-answering. I object to any aspect of evil. Uh -huh. I object to any mixture of evil. And if men know what is good and what is evil, they have no excuse for choosing a mixture. They have no excuse for being gray. In morality, one has to be white. Now, errors of knowledge are not moral flaws. If a man lacks knowledge, that is not evil. But we're speaking about moral issues. That is assuming that a man knows what is good and what is bad, what is white and what is black. He has no moral excuse for choosing to be gray. Thank you. Gray is only a mixture of black and white, and before you can even identify something as gray, you have to know what is black and what is white. Ms. Ayn Rand is our guest, authoress. I'm Michael Jackson, three minutes before 9 o'clock on KNX. Hello. Yes, I would like to ask Miss Rand uh, two questions. Please go ahead. Uh, Miss Rand. Hello. Uh, yes, hello. What do you think of the American government's policy in Southeast Asia, specifically Vietnam? Oh, now that's really a difficult question because I think that the American government got itself in a threat, into a dreadful mess with the total of its foreign policy, and now the situation in Vietnam is as follows. I don't think we have any business there, and I don't think that we can retreat at this time. Uh, don't ask me for a solution. I did not uh, advocate this policy. I'm not an admirer or supporter of it, and therefore no solution can truly be found, which is a good example of the irrationality of our foreign policy for the past 30 years or longer, or longer since World War I. Uh, there is no way out at present. Anything that President Johnson chooses to do now will be wrong in some respect, but I'll tell you one thing that would be totally wrong, and that is his disgraceful offer of paying a reparation of a billion dollars to the enemy. While he's fighting a war on poverty, he should think of what that billion dollars would mean to the American poor and to the American taxpayers and people generally before he gives it away to the Viet Cong. Uh, that, as a policy, would, would only mean an open invitation for anyone, anywhere, to attack us, to kill some American soldiers, and to collect a billion dollars for their troubles. That offer on Johnson's part is the most disgraceful thing in the situation today. I wonder, sir, could we hold for a, a couple of minutes of news for the second question? Oh, well, thank you. And uh, is it all right with you, Miss Rand? Yes, surely. Thank you very much indeed. Our guest is Miss Ayn Rand, authoress of Atlas Shrugged and uh, The Fountainhead and uh, uh, We the Living, and a lady whose theory of objectivity is this evening being fairly well discussed by umpteen people of different beliefs and persuasions. Hollywood One, 9911 is the number if you care to call. It's 905. I'm Michael Jackson on KNX. The phone number, Hollywood One, 9911. Our guest is one of the most 
Widely discussed figures on the contemporary intellectual scene, she advocates, amongst other things, selfishness. Rational selfishness, which means the values required for man's survival. She advocates a new morality, an ethics of, as she puts it, rational self-interest that stands, it appears, in complete opposition to the political and social and religious attitudes of our day. Her unique philosophy is known as objectivism. So it's hello again to Miss Ayn Rand. Um, we're coming to question number two from a gentleman who put question number one. Yes. Yes, uh, Miss Rand, uh, question number two. Uh, what, uh, what can the United States do to bring uh, full equality for the American Negro? I mean by full equality, uh, equal housing, equal jobs, equal social status, equal individual rights, and just plain decent treatment without completely changing our free enterprise system or radically upsetting our entire economic system. Well, now look, yes. there is no reason why anybody should have equal housing with everybody else. You're not talking about an economic issue. There certainly is inequality of housing, inequality of income, among uh, men of all races, certainly among white men. Therefore, there is no reason why the Negroes or any other minority should be guaranteed housing. The only thing you can uh, properly discuss is racial prejudice. That is that Negroes should not be treated uh, improperly or uh, be uh, treated with prejudice because of their color or their race. The only uh, issue here is to treat every individual man as a human being and judge him according to his own action, his own character, and his own performance. Therefore, all that you can discuss properly is to guarantee Negroes individual political rights. And that the government can do by not passing any or permitting any legislation which discriminates against the Negro legally. But now if you speak about private prejudice, uh, racial prejudice, that cannot be achieved or eliminated by law. Uh, in order to eliminate private discrimination, you should advocate individual rights and the philosophy that goes with it. Uh, I will refer you to my article entitled Racism in my book, The Virtue of Selfishness in which I discuss the fact that racism is just the lowest, most primitive form of collectivism. And in any period of history when collectivism is on the rise, men are forced to cling into, uh, to one another into groups, to seek groups, because a collectivist society or a mixed economy like we have today is a, a society of group warfare, pressure group warfare, and the easiest collective to join, particularly of men of not great intelligence, is race. Therefore, racism, the prejudice of racial groups against one another, is a byproduct of collectivism. It is the spread of collectivism that uh, spreads racial prejudice. Why? Because men are taught that the individual has no rights, has no meaning, no significance outside of his group. Only groups count. That is the essence of collectivism. And consequently, racism is on the rise. The only way to abolish racism, private racism, is by advocating individualism and its corollary, a free society. In a free society, uh, the white man's own Rational self-interest would abolish racism. And those who are irrational, those who in insist on running their business or their lives by racial prejudice, would be their o o only victims or their own victims. They should be boycotted by rational men and they should be ostracized. Uh, that is, those who are not racist should refuse to deal with those who are guilty of racial prejudice but you cannot forbid prejudice by law. A racist has a right not to associate with other people if he doesn't want to. Just as a communist 
has a right to preach his ideas, to have his freedom of speech, even though his ideas are evil. In a free society, neither the communist nor the racist would be of much danger to anyone and would gradually be eliminated by people's enlightenment and by people's rational self-interest. Thank you very much for your call, sir. Uh, Ms. Rand, I want to thank you very much. And I, in the last two minutes, I, I, I really say this sincerely, I have learned more in the last two minutes than five years of, of any intensive study on my part. And I want to thank you again. Thank you. Good night. What a limited world it must be. What a limited world. Hollywood 1, 9911. I guess, Miss Ayn Rand. Uh, does the gentleman's statement surprise you, Miss Rand? Hello? Does the gentleman's statement rip surprise you? Well, uh, a little. Uh, uh, why do you ask? I don't know. It surprised me. He sounded like an extremely intelligent man. Uh, sounded like, if one can go by voices, a businessman, a man of the world. And um, was there that much said in the last two minutes? Quite a, a lot was said, yes. Uh, but I didn't know that he, he could catch it all that quickly. Good. He have said things which he has not heard elsewhere. But uh, <coughs> I wish he would read my article where I present it fully if the subject interests him. You mean the one in The, the Virtue of Selfishness? Yes. Good. Miss Ayn Rand, authoress of such works as Atlas Shrugged, uh, The Fountainhead, and The Virtue of Selfishness, which I think has been uh, coming up more than the, the two uh, novels this evening. Hello. Mr. Ruck Jackson? Yes, sir. Miss Rand. Hello. Years ago, I read Fountainhead. Was that your first book? No, it was my third. I see. Thank my you. My first novel was We the Living. Then there was a novelette called Anthem. And then the Fountainhead. I see. Thank you. Now, my question. Would it be, would you agree that it's an objective truth to say that American business was less circumvented by government in 1929 than it was in 1959, and if that be the case, uh, how would your objectivism advise the action taken in contrast to what was taken at the crash time in 1929 and the subsequent several years down into the depths of 32 and 33 of continued deterioration? Was that government a good government to do what they did in stepping in, or if they hadn't, would they have fallen? Or, finally, is it nothing more than an admission that a government merely stepped in to attempt to stave up this other situation? Uh, no, you, I don't think you're putting your question properly. Uh, philosophy does not give you uh, directions for government policy of the moment, but if you want to state it in, in an issue of principle, what you're asking is, was it capitalism? that the free society that was responsible or that had caused the depression of 1929. Yes. Is that your question? I'll place it that way. Uh, well, the answer is no. The depression of 1929, as well as all other earlier depressions in the history of capitalism, were caused by government interference into the economy, more specifically by government manipulation of the money supply. In 29, the factor directly responsible for the depression was the Federal Reserve System and their easy credit policy, which permi permitted an unwarranted expansion of business, and uh, which had to crash sooner or later, and incidentally, which we are in the same situation today. That was coming to my mind. Uh, uh, for details... Bibliography on the subject and books to read, I would suggest that you write to the Objectivist Newsletter for a pamphlet entitled Popular Fallacies About Capitalism, written by Nathaniel Brandon. It will tell you in great detail in what manner the Depression of 1929 was caused by the government. Now, as to your question about the Hoover government, was their policy proper? No, it was thoroughly improper, and the country would have had a chance to recover only if the government at that time had kept its hands off. It would have been bad, but it would have been of short duration, and there would have been a chance for the economy to get stabilized. As it was, Hoover originated all the controls 
uh, all the fundamental controls for which Franklin Roosevelt later took the credit, so that the fault was equally divided between the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, and the depression was not cured, in effect, until World War II, if you want to call it a cure, because that is the usual cure, in quotes, of all controlled economies. The country actually never recovered from that depression and hasn't recovered yet, if you think in terms of long-range effects. Thank you, sir, for your call. Very thought-provoking. Thank you. Good night. Hollywood One, nine nine one one. This is KNX. This is Ayn Rand. New York City is our guest. I'm Michael Jackson. Hello. Hello, Ms. Rand. Go ahead, sir. Um, I've read in your objectivist newsletter that it is possible to have monopolies in our economy, and I wonder if you could please explain briefly how this is possible. Uh, you read that it is not possible. That it is possible. Yes. No, you have not read it in the newsletter. Unless, uh, I wonder what you mean by monopoly. Monopoly, a monopoly such as a trust. Uh, monopoly usually means a coercive monopoly. That is, a business which uh, holds exclusive, uh, an exclusive field of uh, business or industry and forbids the entry of competitors, makes the entry of competitors impossible in that field. That is a coercive monopoly. You did not read in the newsletter that such a monopoly is possible in a free enterprise system. How do you stop it, ma'am? Because we have always said the exact opposite. So which uh, article are you citing? Um, I don't recall which article it was. I heard it in a discussion at school. But, ma'am, well, how do you stop it? Now, I will ask you to please speak firsthand. If you heard it in a discussion at school, you may have heard anything. Well, then, Ms. Rand, while the gentleman's on the line, let me ask you, how do you stop a coercive monopoly in a completely free society? How do you want? Stop it. How do you stop it? Yes. The free market stops it, because the moment a monopoly is established, let us say, right. in a given line, and it produces something inefficiently and charges uh, a la uh, great prices for, for a product which someone else may produce cheaper, and better. There is no way for that alleged monopolist to stop the competitor from entering the field and taking all his business away from him. On a free market, a businessman has to do his best, the best possible, in order to keep any part of the market, and he has no way to forbid competitors for producing and trading. He has no way to forbid them by force. The only way that can be done is by government, by an act of the government. Uh, uh, you don't think the act of the government... ...prevent others from taking his market away from him Ma'am, if you... he makes a better and cheaper product. It's competition that protects the freedom of the market. You don't believe that the act of the government can be there to protect the smaller businessman from the monopoly? Uh, look, a monopoly or a competition enforced by law is a contradiction in terms. Thank you very much. Why yes. do you think that the small businessman is entitled to protection? After all, in the free market, the big businessman, if he isn't using government help to grow big, has earned his place by ability, by productive ability, by giving the public something good which the public wants. Why should some inept beginner be entitled to compete with him? Now, if the beginner is not inept, then he will compete, and he might even take the market away from the first businessman. But if he's merely small, smallness as such, it, it does not entitle anyone to any particular protection. That's the, the opinion of Miss Ayn Rand. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Miss Rand. Hollywood One, 9911 is the phone number. Our guest, Miss Ayn Rand. I'm Michael Jackson on KNX, and we'll continue in just one minute. Hollywood One, 9911. Our guest, Miss Ayn Rand. Hello. Hello? Yes. Is the caller on the line? Hello. Yes, please go ahead, ma'am. Uh, Michael Jackson? Yes, ma'am, please go ahead. Miss Rand? Yes. I am not satisfied or find satisfaction in 
money in earning money because it is not earned by... Can you speak a little louder, please? Yes, of course. I'll start over. I find that I'm not satisfied, nor do I find satisfaction in money earned because I do not earn it by my values or by my beliefs, but really rather by a shallow use of a talent. By what? A A shallow use. use of a talent. Uh-huh. That does sometimes bring me some elation. Enjoy, in other words, I enjoy being somewhat successful. Now my question is, how does someone achieve individual value in a world that judges not by the values of individuality, but rather by our ability to succeed materially? Particularly when, to be perfectly frank, we find ourselves in the need of approval of our fellow man whatever his values be. Well, you see, your answer is contained right in your question. If you place the approval of your fellow men above your own judgment, even when their values are wrong, uh, if you place their opinion above your own values, then, of course, you'll never achieve any satisfaction, neither in work nor in anything else. The point is, that one can enjoy the approval of one's fellow man only when their values are rational, when they are right, and when they correspond to what you know to be right. But if you can do some work on, of which you are proud say, and others approve of it or understand and appreciate it, that is fine, that is a proper reward. But if your values differ from those around you, and you know that you're right. You cannot sacrifice that which is right but for the approval of those whom you yourself know to be wrong. Then let us say that it was not just for the approval, but it was also because of being in a perfectly practical situation of needing to support a family. How do I, which do I put for, first, the support of the family, which I love very much, or the belief in values which I do not find myself living up to day by day with my abilities. You see, I do not believe that one can achieve anything, uh, not for any length of time, uh, by compromising uh, one's convictions and values. Uh, If what you say is true, that is, if you could do much better work and use your talent in a more profound way, you would do better financially as well. It is not true that you can help your family by, in effect, doing a superficial job or using your talent in a shallow way, as you put it. Uh, This may work for the range of the moment, but you will find in the long run that you will be defeated, that you would undercut your own earning capacity and the value that you may be to those you love. Oh, Anne Ryan, from whence come courage? Pardon? From I, whence come courage? I don't hear you. Where does one get courage? From the conviction that one is right. And if you need a little help on the subject, I would suggest that you read The Fountainhead. Because I read the, the character Fountainhead. of Peter Keating in it is exactly in your position, although he did not... Uh, compromised because uh, he wanted to support others, but he uh, wanted the approval of society above everything else. He was very successful for a while. Read what happened to him psychologically, and that is the pattern which applies to everybody in every line of work and in every degree of success, big or small. If you make a success against your own conviction, you'll pay for it, and so will your loved ones. And uh, as to courage, I have always said that I'm not brave enough to be a coward. I see the consequences too clearly. Oh. I would suggest that you think this over. I Rand, I like you. <laughs> Thank you. Good night, ma'am. I hope that answers your question. Michael? Yes, dear. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. wonder who that was. Hollywood 1, 9911. Trying to put, as we did before about half an hour ago, Miss Rand, a, a face or, or a personality to a voice. I, I have a feeling she's in the entertainment world. I don't hear you. Oh. All right, let's take the next call then. Okay? Yeah. Hello? Oh, hello? Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Uh, Mr. Jackson? Yes, sir. Uh, I have 
sort of an epistemological question. I don't hear you. Would you put it? I'll... Sort of an epistemological question. Uh, I understand that you consider your ethics absolute. Uh, is this correct? Hello? The gentleman said he understands that you consider your ethics absolute. I don't know what he means by the word in that context. Would he define, please? Uh, you mean absolute or, or ethics? What do you mean by absolute ethics? Do you consider them to be absolutely or completely demonstrated? Yes. Pro provable? Provable, yes. Uh, deductively or inductively? Both. Both? Yep. Oh, and then I would, if, if they're proved inductively, could you comment on uh, oh, Hume's uh, objection to the inductive inference? Uh, that is not a question which one can answer in five minutes. Uh, have you answered this anywhere in print? Pardon? Have you answered this anywhere in print? No, uh, except indirectly. Uh, uh, if you read the Objectivist newsletter for the past four years, you will find references to it. Uh, well, uh, or, for a brief reference, I will suggest you read the title essay of For the New Intellectual, where I discuss Hume and other philosophers, but very briefly. However, that might give you an indication. Uh, one, uh, to one cover other the question right now, I will say that Hume's fallacy is the fact that he was waging a war against man's conceptual ability against the conceptual level of man's consciousness. Hume did not recognize the validity of forming concepts, and therefore he is guilty of the worst contradiction. He is using concepts in order to prove that concepts cannot exist and are not valid and do not give us knowledge of reality. That's uh, one for a very brief answer. If you one want. other quick question. Uh, is any ethical statement or any moral statement is an imperative? Uh, how does one propose to prove it an imperative? Hello? Oh, I just said that any ethical statement is an imperative. It's like a statement, go close the door, it's a command. Look, that has already... How can you prove a command? That viewpoint is uh, already passé. You are quoting as a fact a school of thought which is already discredited and which I, for one, never shared. Who discredited it? It is sheer like nonsense to assert uh -huh. that uh, value propositions have no bearing or no connection to reality. Here I would say you better read the objectivist ethics. Well, now, while the gentleman is on the line... ...as a pamphlet or as the lead yes. article in The Virtue of Selfishness, in which I tell you on what facts of reality I base my ethics. I cannot repeat the proof for you here except to indicate it. Ma'am, while the gentleman's on the line... The ethics yes. statement refers to reality. It uh -huh. refers to an appraisal, an evaluation, a choice but between alternate courses, courses where, in reality, man has to survive by means of making choices, and it is the requirement of his nature, qua man, qua rational being, that sets the terms, that defines what kind of rules, what kind of moral code he should accept if he is to survive. It is the nature of a living entity that determines its particular code of values. Miss Rand, is ethics the province of whims? Hello? Is ethics the province of whims? W-H-I-M-S? What? What are ethics, ma'am? Ethics is a code of values, uh, a code of good and evil, or right or wrong, that directs man's choices and actions, the kind of fundamental choices and actions which determine the course of his life. That's my definition. Is it, is it tied up with personal emotions and social edicts? It is not. Religion? No, it is based on reason. I see. Sir, thank you very much for your call. Thank you. Good night. This is KNX and KNX FM, CBS Radio in Los Angeles. Our guest is Miss Ayn Rand in New York City, authoress, and the phone number, Hollywood 1 9911. Hello. Yes, uh, Mr. Jackson, Miss Rand. Good evening. Hello. What is your uh, thinking on states and federal governments uh, stand on putting to death? men and women having 
been convicted of certain crimes. Capital punishment, ma'am. I don't hear the question. What is your opinion of capital punishment? Well, in principle, I would be in favor of capital punishment uh, to this extent. If a man takes another man's life, if he is guilty of premeditated murder, morally he does deserve to forfeit his own life. But the difficulty comes in the fact that no absolute proof can always be given. That is, with all the precautions, errors of justice are possible. And therefore, I think a good argument could be made, and I guess I would be more or less in favor of abolishing capital punishment, not out of sympathy or pity for the actual murder, but on the uh, premise that it is better to put nine murderers in jail for life rather than execute one innocent man. And since uh, juries are fallible, uh, on that ground alone, only on the ground of the possible error, should one abolish capital punishment. Thank you, sir, for your call. Hollywood One, nine nine one one. Our guest, Ms. Ayn Rand. I'm Michael Jackson. Hello. Hello. I have a question for Ms. Rand, which has come up uh, among some of these students with objectivism here at UCLA. Good. Uh, in a moral field, and it goes like this. How does one prove, using objectivism's principles, that it is in one's self-interest to carry on a love relationship with only one person in any one period, as opposed to, say, with two persons of equally high value in the same period? I don't hear the question. Uh, uh, what are the arguments uh, against polygamy? I'll repeat this question for you. How does one prove, using objectivism's principles, that it is in one's self-interest to carry on a love relationship with only one person in any one period, as opposed to, say, with two persons of equally high value in the same period? What premises, what... Uh, how would one start to attack this question? It so isn't one... a question really to be proved by objectivism only. It is a question of human psychology generally. That is, <clears throat> what objectivism would say is that one should have a romantic or sexual relationship only with the person whom one evaluates as very high value indeed. One should not engage in romance or sex sex with someone about whose character one has doubts. And if one uh, has a romance only with a person of high moral character, then by that very token, one cannot divide one's affection. One may very well, in fact, be in love with two uh, men or two women at the same time in the sense of very high appreciation. That is possible. But one cannot put uh, that feeling into practice because it is actually impossible to divide your feeling between two values. You have to make a choice and you have to decide which value is the highest one for you. And uh, psychologically, it would be an impossible conflict to be torn between two values. Thank you for your question, sir. I see. Thank you very much. Good night. Hollywood One, 9911. Our subjects appear to be many. Our guest appears to be one woman with many, many, many ideas. Miss Ayn Rand, authoress of Atlas Shrugged, uh, The Fountainhead, We the Living, Anthem, The Virtue of Selfishness, and Umpteen Papers. We'll continue in just one minute. I'm Michael Jackson, KNX. Hello. Hello. Miss Rand is on the line. Thank you. Miss Rand, I have recently been introduced to philosophy and objectivism by your Pardon? Go ahead. Oh, by your books. And I would very much appreciate your opinion on a problem I've run into. I would like your opinion, if you have any knowledge of him, of Tom Dooley. Dr. Tom Dooley? No, I don't. I'm sorry. He died about a year and a half, or perhaps two years ago. He was an American doctor who went out to the Orient and worked amongst the natives and was very much revered. I don't know the name, but I don't know very much about him. Oh, I see. Go ahead, ma'am. Well, I had the opinion, more or less, that he was accidentally thrown into this situation in the East because he was in the Navy as a doctor, and that it was only then, when he was with these people, 
that he became interested in them more as a personal matter than a uh, than a sociological one. Yes. I was wondering if under those circumstances you think that uh, this, well, it was almost a self-sacrifice, could have been uh, acceptable under the objectivist philosophy. That depends actually on his motive. I have heard, but I don't know uh, how reliably that he had actually very good scientific motives. Uh, but what the objectivist philosophy would say as a principle is this. If you want to help others, and you can do so without sacrificing yourself, then it is proper. If it is a sacrifice, then one shouldn't. Now, what do I mean by a sacrifice? A sacrifice means the surrender of a lesser, of a greater value, for a lesser value or a non-value. Therefore, uh, in this case, if Dr. Dooley wanted to do something else, wanted it more, but gave it up, because the people needed him, that would be a sacrifice, and that would be improper. But if he was a scientist, and he was uh, pursuing his own career, and he wanted to help these people because it was a scientific problem in very difficult and tragic circumstances, then he was acting properly. The whole issue, of course, only he himself could answer it. But what I'm saying is that he must not, and no one must, give up their greatest values for uh, uh, the sake of helping others. That is self-sacrifice. But merely undertaking a difficult job of helping others when it coincides with your own interest, uh, scientific or professional, that is quite proper. In fact, that's heroic. Miss Rand, uh, perhaps Nathaniel Brandon sums it up when he says no one ever really sacrifices himself. When did Nathaniel Brandon say that? Uh, in his paper, Isn't Everyone Selfish? And he goes on to say, since every purposeful action is motivated by some value or goal that the actor desires, one always acts selfishly, whether one knows it or not. But do you accept that? Look, I think it is truly contemptible, if you will forgive me, to quote anyone that way. Miss, you're quoting Mr. Brandon's presentation of the very viewpoint that he is opposing. The article is entitled, Isn't Everyone Selfish? And Mr. Brandon proves precisely the opposite of the view which you are quoting and which he quotes as the enemy view. Fine. Now that then we get an answer from you. Turn, please, to the last paragraph, the concluding paragraph of that article, and read it to us. Mm -hmm. All right. A genuine selfishness, that is, a genuine concern with discovering what is to one's self-interest, an acceptance of the responsibility of achieving it, a refusal ever to betray it by acting on the blind whim, mood, impulse, or feeling of the moment, an uncompromising loyalty to one's judgment, convictions, and values, represents a profound moral achievement. Those who assert that everyone is selfish, and that's in quotations, commonly intend their statement as an expression of cynicism and contempt. But the truth is that their statement pays mankind a compliment that it does not deserve. That's it. Now you see that is quite clearly stated. Yes, but without using words like contemptible, we get the answer from you. Pardon? I say without using words like contemptible, uh, we get the answer. No, no, but he does not believe that everyone is selfish because they act on some kind of motive. Mm -hmm. That is precisely the idea he is opposing and I am opposing. Good. Ma'am, I hope that in part answers your question. Very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Hollywood One, nine nine one one. Our guest, Miss Ayn Rand. I'm Michael Jackson on KNX. Hello. Hello. Yes, go ahead. Ah, uh, yes. Thank you so much. I would like to tell Miss Rand that I certainly admire her moral philosophy. And earlier in the program, I understood her to say that she was an atheist. And I would like to know how a person. Uh, arrives at this conclusion that they are an atheist. Hello? Yes. One arrives at it by reason. If one is on the premise that one must not accept anything on faith, one must not accept anything without rational proof and evidence, then one concludes that there is no proof or evidence for the existence of anything supernatural 
or of a supernatural being such as God. You see, one doesn't arrive at atheism by uh, objecting to religion. One arrives at it by supporting reason, reason I see. as an absolute. I see, but uh, Ms. Rand, uh, does, does this never leave you with a lonely feeling? <laughs> no, dear, never. It leaves me with a very clean, confident feeling that the universe is not unknowable, that it is not a mystery, and that there are no supernatural phenomena disposing of my life. It leaves me with the feeling of responsibility. I see. Well, thank you very much. Good night. Good night. Good night.